for this movie, you know, you, I don't know if it's a reputation or whatever, but like, you know, your movies kind of transcend traditional genre and are kind of set within the realm of storytelling is the way that I like to describe movies that I really like and I just want people to see. Um, is that like by design? Like, do you get an idea? Do you get a character? What do you start with when you come up with a movie like this, like Synchronic? Yeah, the, the idea and the, the character usually come up pretty close to each other, or it's like, for, for whatever, if the, the concept kind of tickles our imagination, usually it's very quickly after that that the right character for that uh, comes about. Um, but the, uh, the, the thing about like, whether we do this sort of like, maybe kind of hard to describe genre wise thing by, by design. Um, one thing is it's, it's probably bizarre. We just, I guess we very, very rarely talk about what genre we, we want the movie to be in. And it's more about like, Hey, what's the interesting idea? And then what is the best way to tell that story that is the, the funniest, scariest, most human way of telling that and just following impulses that are, that are less based in genre or homage or this meets this. Um, but that said, very quickly after like the first draft of the script, you have to be able to describe the movie as a this meets this and have a genre. I mean, just, just describing it to anyone, yeah. but whether it's other producers or it's, or it's, it's the audience or the, the people who you know you would hope the movie would appeal to, um, but uh, but yeah, I guess a good way to put it is like there's no design. There's just following a bunch of instincts and then trying to define it after the fact. Yeah, sure. Um, it's you know it's one of those things where I want people to watch the movie, but I don't want to tell them that much about what it's about i want them to go in as blind as i did I'm, I'm lucky that in this job they're like hey there's a movie and some people do you want to see it i'm like yeah so i see these movies and i don't even look at the log line that's great uh, first because it's like why spoil it if i'm gonna watch it anyway i um, i ascribe to that too as soon as i've decided i'm gonna see a movie i just try to avoid everything about it yeah yeah they're like a new trailer nope don't care i'm already in I don't need it. <laughs> so cool. Thank you. But, um, you know, well, for you guys, you know, I know that you probably don't have a terrible amount of control over marketing your movies. That's kind of, you know, after it's left your hands. But, you know, do you have, uh, you know, any kind of any kind of control over, you know, oh, we don't want to, you know, because you see these movies where like they'll put the last shot in a trailer. You know? <laughs> yeah. Not um, to name any names, but you know what I mean. Yeah, we we don't have control over the marketing. However, we can definitely say uh, we've been super lucky that our distributor, Wellgo, for, for this movie and The Endless, they distributed that as well. Uh, they've been extraordinarily collaborative. Um, so uh, one thing that we are able to offer is we can, we have early on meetings with them and tell them what we think appeals about the movie. Um, and, uh, and what, where that comes from actually is traveling with the film to film festivals. We'll even ask people like, why'd you come see this movie? What was it? Was it us? Was it, was it Anthony Mackie? Was it Jamie Dornan? Was it the, uh, well, I guess you're not spoiling, but the, the central concept, um, of the film, um, or was it just a cool picture you saw? Was it a poster? And, uh, and we can actually offer that input. And, uh, and they do let us also give input to designing the trailer and the poster and all of that, but, but really that is out of our hands and we don't want to take anything away from the marketing people that created those things. Um, but then also at a certain point, things just start appearing on the internet that we didn't know existed. And there is just a marketing department churning out stuff for this film, um, which is also punching way above its weight because it's not a studio film. It's still like a small distributor, you know, doing its thing. Um, but yeah, um, we, we, we get some input. We have no control, but they let us, they, they listen to us. It's a very healthy collaboration. Well, you know, kind of speaking of that behind the scenes, you know, relationship in the, between the filmmaker and a distributor, you know, you make independent films. Uh, and this is obvious, you know, you've probably been over this a million times, but this is a very different uh, season for independent films. 
uh, you're not touring the film festivals, at least not in the same way that you would have uh, a year ago. You know, I, I've talked to people who've made movies uh, this year and how, how weird it is. Uh, and I've talked to people who've made movies that were supposed to debut at film festivals that didn't happen. And so they don't know what's going to happen to their movies. So I don't know, I guess you don't get to take the traditional victory lap of, you know, a guy with hors d'oeuvres uh, and free cocktails and all that. But, uh, you know, how are you, uh, you know, clinking your glasses together, after, you know, now that this movie is finally going to be out in the wild and that people can consume it, but you can't go to a party to celebrate that fact? I guess we, we, we're celebrating by making another movie. <laughs> we're, we're approaching the end of week three on, a, on another small movie. Um, and uh, it's, it's really nice. I mean... We've never been, sh I don't think we've ever been shooting a movie during the release of a movie, hmm. but it keeps you much more emotionally healthy <laughs> because you're, you know, you're not, not reading all the like, press not, like not, that, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like there's no time to obsessively, you know, see what your re reviews you're getting and how people are talking about it. Um, but I'll also like on the topic of like this time period in this time in history, you know, up until, up until COVID, we were going through this really extraordinary golden age of like, like the 200,000 to $500,000 US dollars um, uh, independent film at the budget. And because of the technology and, and there was production methods of doing that, you can make these films. And there were so many great films came out of that over the last decade. And, and um, we, those were, that was a lot of our movies were those movies. Um, and, and now with the way things are for a while, we're not gonna have those movies. Um, there, there will no, there will be no two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars for a while because most of that. I mean, it's about two hundred thousand dollars to have a COVID safe set, um, and that's just for a small movie. Right? Yeah, which means you know you're doubling without increasing the value of your movie. You are doubling its budget. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and you know, we know that the the, the six million dollar sets. That's almost like a million dollars in COVID safety, and it's just hard. It's 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 almost impossible for anyone. I mean, everyone's in an impossible situation. There's, there's no, there's no answer. Uh, as, as a creator um, of films, uh, I wouldn't know what to tell distributors and exhibitors, uh, uh, financiers. It's just almost impossible. You have to find this like silver bullet of a film that happens to have the exact right cost delta, you know, or go make a movie with your three friends that is fully quarantined for almost nothing. That also, that's also a, a way of, to adapt. Is it uh, too early to ask which of those your current movie is? Oh God! Oh, it's it's the we're doing that. So so you got so to, su to sum up, there's two options here. You can either go do essentially a no budget movie, not nothing's no budget, but but um, substantially less than two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. You can go do that, or you can go do something giant, a, a, a big TV show, a big movie. Um, you'll be shocked. We've been hired for one of those, but <laughs> that was sarcastic. We no one. Should. <laughs> uh, but but um, but we're we're doing the uh, we're doing the one we can do the the essentially almost no budget. Thing. Sure, um, you got two maybe the two hottest guys not just in Hollywood just around. Just like if you see those two guys, good looking dudes. They are so <laughs> handsome. Sexy yeah. guys. Oh yeah. my god! Like, can you please just get some acne, like, like right here, so that we can just like, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> they're too. They're so beautiful. They're, they are paramedics, but they also model on the side. <laughs> no. Um. Well, well, you know, how did you get these two guys? Did you did you seek them out? Did the script fly by their desk and they call you up and they're like, "Hey, I'm Anthony Mack. I want to be in your movie." Oh. <laughs> you know, what's that? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. yeah, that would be great. Uh, the, the story is actually, um, to, to take it back, is for three movies we've been trying to uh, get other movies off the ground that, um, that had what, what one would call a traditional movie star or celebrity or something like that in it. Um, and they didn't happen, so we'd make the second movie, Spring, and then we made the third movie, uh, The Endless. Um, and we kind of lost faith in the idea that that actually works. It's like, I guess that just works for other people, and for whatever reason doesn't work for us. And, um, but, we, you know, we'll, we'll keep on trying. And then in the meantime, we'll keep making our smaller movies. And Synchronic was written before The Endless. And, uh, and, when, we, and when The Endless came out, the, 
uh, an agent named Houston Costa went to go see it on a lark on a, you know, on its last screening in North Hollywood. Uh, he liked the poster. He just walked on in. And uh, that's Jamie Dornan's agent who called us up and just went nuts over us. And he's like a really cool friend and, and just an amazing, amazing uh, agent. And we were able to get Jamie Dornan in Synchronic. And Jamie and Anthony had always wanted to work together. Uh, so, so there was a connection there at the agency and professionally, but also the director, Joe Lynch, uh, was working with Anthony and we, we hit him up and said, can you tell Anthony, like, we're going to send him this script, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe he'll read it. And then, uh, on top of that, we've heard, uh, from Anthony and we just, we don't know, we can't, ver <laughs> we can't, we can't verify this. Uh, but we heard from Anthony that the, uh, the Russo brothers, for whatever reason, told Anthony, like, hey, if you ever get the chance to work with those guys, you should. Uh, don't know in what context that happened, but we heard it, so. All right, well, so with that in mind, you know, you, you, you want to do movies where you have just complete creative control. The Russos come up to you and they're like, hey, do you want to do, like, Doctor Strange or whatever? What, or what, what are you going to do? Oh, yeah, we'll do say no? oh, yeah, we'll yeah. do Doctor Strange. <laughs> <laughs> we, would for, we would for sure. If we ever had the opportunity to do something, like to do Doctor Strange, we would definitely do Doctor Strange if that mm -hmm. opportunity to present itself. Well, so, so, you know, what you were saying before about casting, um, you know, was it always going to be you two in The Endless? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, everything in The Endless was constructed to be as do it yourself as possible. It was, it was weird because it, it got... It got a little bit, it's funny, it's still a tiny movie. It got a little bit bigger than we anticipated when um, when our producer, Dave, proposed that we actually seek finding financing for it. Aaron and I were just gonna pay for the whole thing. Again, it's still a tiny budget movie, but it was the first movie where we an, inv an investor came in and, and helped us out a bit. Um, so it got a little bigger, but, but originally, I mean, it was even smaller and it was always, uh, it was always written for Aaron and I to play those those characters. Well, you know, I just I want to get uh, as many people as possible to to see the movie that we're talking about, but talking around. So I don't know. Could you give uh, your like to the Screen Rant reader? You know why this movie is important and worth watching. Uh, I'll I'll give a shot, which is um, a lot of. Are we, uh, sorry, are we talking about time travel? Is that okay? Is that a spoiler? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Hey, okay. it's your movie. Just making sure. <laughs> so a lot of movies that involve time travel are, get, get really into the mechanic of, you know, can you change the past or something like that? And this movie tries to completely change the way in which we look at time travel as more of something that's not a form of wish fulfillment, but is actually a horror. Um, and it's something that we shouldn't really want to go back to. And instead, we should be embracing the present. And, uh, and so in some ways we're kind of like, the, the movie is calling for um, a recognition of human connection as one of the most important values that we have. Uh, and so that is, that is why I would pitch the movie without talking about the plot. Or that is how I would pitch the movie without talking about the plot. Sure, well, thank you so much. The movie is fantastic. I'm gonna let you go now, um, but you know, whatever you do next, I'm gonna be there too. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, well, thanks so much, and I'll catch you on the next one. Awesome. Thank you, Zach. Thank you.